Eat, sleep, bet, repeat. That's how we get down on the opening line at EliteSportsBetting.com. I'll be your host, Benny Ricciardi. And as usual for Thursdays, we're keeping the football going. We're back talking some NFL. And I got my man Tyler here, fresh off a huge week where we absolutely crushed it. I made a ton of money on that D.C. Defenders game, betting against my hometown New York Guardian. So thank you for that, Tyler. I appreciate it. Yeah, absolutely. The XFL product has been on fire. Uh, I don't care what the ratings say. They're going to see a, a slight decrease between week one and week two. Everyone's excited for week mm. one. But the product was still great. Everyone that watched the games had a lot of fun. Uh, it was a very profitable week for any elite sports betting members. Mm -hmm. I went eight and one on the bets that were put on the site. Huge week. Um, going to keep it rolling here. I mean, I think this week's another pretty straightforward week for us. I uh, should have some good information for you. All right. Yeah. I mean, hey, and the thing I like about this is, you know, every week we're going to get four games. They spread them all out. So it's not like the NFL where you're flipping through channels and watching red zone and trying to catch all the action. Like if you want to sit down and watch football, you can sit down and watch football straight through on Saturday afternoon, straight through on Sunday afternoon as well there. Um, you know, as Tyler mentioned, we got the bets going up in the bet package at uh, EliteSportsBetting.com. And if you're playing a little DFS, which I saw a couple nice screenshots from some of our subscribers this week, if you're playing a little DFS, you could always go over to um, fantasyguru.com. That's where we have all the XFL information going up for, for anybody who's playing fantasy. We got guys like Tyler, guys like Armando, um, you know, Jeff Manns, all putting stuff in there. And you know what? So far, so good. So let's see if we can keep it going for a third week. So we're going to start right at the top, the Houston Roughnecks, one of the, uh, I'm not going to call them a big surprise, but one of the little surprises so far of the league, 2-0 <clears throat> to start the season, they beat LA, they beat St. Louis, um, St. Louis being a, a pretty good game last week, 28-24, they are a six and a half point favorite over the Tampa Bay Vipers, uh, 45 and a half is the total that I'm seeing here, the Vipers are 0-2, they lost to uh, the New York Guardians, 23-3. First game of the year, they lost the second game to, to – oh, wait, no, did I say that wrong? Yeah, they lost to Seattle, 17-9 last week, right? Correct, yes. Yeah, all right. So, they, yeah, so they're 0-2, Houston 2-0, and Houston a six-and-a-half point favorite on the road. What are we looking at in this one? Yeah, the Roughnecks should run all over this squad. The Vipers just have no offense, and this is going to be a lot like the AAF, where we're going to see team, the haves and the have-nots with quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. That's really how this league has been run so far. And Houston's quarterback, Philip Walker, is just head and shoulders above whatever kind of trio the Vipers are going to roll out. Aaron Murray is still banged up, but he looked absolutely dreadful in his week one debut. Yeah. Had under a 50% completion rate. And then they tried to do a combination of Taylor Cornelius and Quentin Flowers last week. That didn't do much better as the tandem combined for three interceptions, four sacks. Mm -hmm. They were held under 175 total passing yards. And I think poor quarterback play has just really limited this Vipers um, offense as a whole. Houston, on the other hand, I mean, they've just been on fire so far. They've been putting up over 40 points over the first two weeks of the season. Um, I'm sorry, the, excuse me, the Vipers have allowed over 40 points the first two weeks of the season. Houston has allowed a league leading, has scored a league leading amount of points. Mm -hmm. So there's just, it's just going to be a huge, huge spread here. And minus six was what it opened at. I'm surprised it's only at six and a half right now. I would still hit this. I think Houston has no problem beating the Vipers. And it's almost solely because the Roughnecks pass at one of the league's heaviest rates and they mm -hmm. have no problem spreading teams out going four wide. They've got Cam Phillips who had three touchdowns last week, but most importantly, he's got a 26% target share of the offense that trails only Nelson Spruce playing on 99% of the offensive snaps. He's either priced as the wide receiver one or wide receiver two on DraftKings this week. But mm. I think he and Spruce, you just kind of start there with your builds and go from there. Cause they're just really strong high floor target guys. Uh, we saw Sammy Coates uh, still kind of struggle. He did get a long touchdown called back last week. So people that are just box score watching won't notice that. Uh, Cleo Lewis and Nick Holly ran out this receiving group. But yeah, this is just a, an offense where you want to stack Walker and his top receiving options just because they're so darn good. Yeah, and you know what? I like the fact that this game has stayed under seven. I mean, again, with the way that they do the extra points and everything, we talked about how the seven mm -hmm. might not be as key of a number. But still, I mean, at minus six and a half, I'm, I'm, I'm all aboard on Houston this week. D.C. was my big bet last week. Looks like Houston's probably going to be the one this week after, you know, my initial looks at all these games here today. Uh, so let's move on to the next one. We got the Dallas Renegades going up against the Seattle Dragons. Renegades favored by five on the road, so second road favorite here. A little bit lower total, 43 and a half in this one. 
Uh, Dallas lost to St. Louis their first game. Second game, they came back last week and beat L.A. Um, the Seattle Dragons are 0-2. They got beat pretty badly, 31-19 against D.C. in the opener. Lost to Tampa Bay, looking pretty bad. Oh, I'm sorry, they beat no, they Tampa won. Bay yes. last week. Yeah, they're 1-1. One one. Yeah, so yep. sorry, that, I had that game written down wrong. That's why when I was looking at it, I'm like, wait, this doesn't make sense. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so they beat Tampa Bay last week, 17-9. But again, Tampa Bay is a pretty bad team, so that doesn't really tell us too much. Kind of makes sense that Dallas is favoring this one, right? Yeah, Landry Jones' debut wasn't spectacular by any means, but it was still pretty solid. I mean, he had some rust. It kind of was evident, but they still did pretty well here. And he's got a really good matchup here against the Dragons' pass defense. They're number seven ranked in coverage per PFF, seven out of eight, so that's not right. good. Um, and those pass defense numbers might even be a little bit inflated considering they're just coming off a matchup against the Vipers, which, like I said earlier, the Taylor Cornelius and Quentin Flowers tambo, uh, combo is not a really good tandem. So I think we see Landry Jones have a really good day here. His primary pass catcher, Donald Parham, he's the six foot eight tight end. Mm -hmm. uh, he was uh, a captain I used in all my showdown slates. It was a really good week because he had 11 targets. He had a touchdown. Uh, he almost had a second one, was just overthrown. I don't know how you overthrow a six foot eight tight end. Yeah, that's not an easy thing to do right there. Only Landry Jones, man. Yeah, <laughs> and, and uh, maybe Cam Newton, but we'll get into that later. Uh, they've got some capable receivers in Jeff Bidet and. Um, I guess Flynn Nagel, he kind of went a little bit backwards in terms of targets, dropping from six to three. Mm -hmm. uh, Jazz Ferguson, he's the guy that a lot of people are excited about, but he was an active last week. Maybe he makes his return right now. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe he makes his return this week. He could definitely be a vertical element that they add. But the, the backfield here has been really surprisingly good between Cameron's Artist Payne and Lance Dunbar. Mm -hmm. Not only are they rushing really well, the, team, the Dallas Renegades lead the league in yards per carry, but Cap and Dunbar are both having a high floor due to high target volume. They're mm -hmm. both um, being propelled by that, which makes them consistent fantasy targets, which is really hard to find in the, at the running back position in this league. So finding guys that are able to have that high floor are guys that I'm kind of prioritizing mm -hmm. as I build DFS lineups. And Cap and Dunbar are definitely going to be heavily rotated. I like to play a lot of 20 max entries because that's kind of my bread and butter of where I find my, my, my sweet spot, basically, of where yep. I do best. And I'll have a lot of Cap and Dunbar in those. Um, as far as the Seattle Dragons, Brandon Silvers has just been pretty poor as far as a quarterback under a 50% completion rate. He has a real big issue, like challenging defenses vertically. He has just a 5.4 yards per attempt. The Dragons rarely threw last week. He had just 18 attempts, seven completions, as the team just continued to use their three-headed backfield of Farrow, Trey Williams, Jaquan Gardner. Mm -hmm. I think we're just going to continue to see all those three backs heavily rotated, and it makes none of them fantasy viable because of it. Yeah, that's one of the problems with this team as well. And also, it's not like this team has been putting up a lot of points. I mean, they, they had right. 19 in the first week, and then, you know, they won their game last week only scoring 17 just because the other team's offense was worse than theirs was. But, you know, when you're talking about fantasy-wise, this is definitely not the high-scoring spot that you're looking for. Although Cameron Artis Payne did help me win some money last week, so I definitely thank him. Uh, so let's move on and talk about the next game here. My hometown, New York Guardians, going on the road against the St. Louis Battlehawks. Now, like I said, the Battlehawks have been one of the surprises so far this year. Um, they won their first game. I think they beat Dallas in that game, 15, was it 15 to nine, the final score there. And then they lost to a good Houston team, 28-24. But there's no shame in that with Houston being one of the, uh, you know, co-favorites at the moment to kind of win the whole thing at 2-0 at and here. This is their first home game as well. Their first two games are on the road. So they finally get to come home. And they take on a Guardians team who's coming off just getting absolutely waxed by D.C. last week. So what are you looking at in this one? Uh, Battlehawks favored by 10, over under 40 and a half. Yeah, this is a huge spread, a 10-point spread here. Uh, one of my biggest oversights entering the year was Jordan Tamu, not thinking he had any kind of accuracy to him. But mm -hmm. he kind of leads league in all starting quarterbacks of 78.1%. He is tied for the uh, league lead in yards per attempt, 7.7. .7. So he's not just dinking and dunking. He's thrown downfield as well. Mm -hmm. He's got some quality receivers in De Mornay, Pearson L., who's their slot receiver, and LaDamian Washington, mm -hmm. who is a uh, explosive, uh, fast, tall receiver. I just like that tandem there of Pearson L. and Washington. I, mm -hmm. I would like going with Tamu and his two top wideouts as a strong part of your core in DFS this week. I think the, this team just runs all over the Guardians. Uh, we saw Matt McGloin butt heads with Kevin Gilbride over the offensive game plan. Mm. I haven't seen anything regarding a quarterback change, but if McGloin's poor performance continues, he's got a 47.9% completion rate, a league low 4.7 yards per attempt. 
The guy just isn't connecting on deep shots either. Mikhail McKay leads the squad with 11 targets through two games. That's not very much. Five of those targets that went for 20 plus yards. So keep McKay in mind for any kind of tournaments. Mm -hmm. Perhaps we see Marquise Williams, the former North Carolina quarterback that everyone's excited about take over, but that might not happen until the second half. If like they're down by multiple scores, I don't know. That's just projection there, but McGloin cannot continue to lead the squad because it's just been dreadful. I mean, th mm -hmm. their offense just does nothing and not helping the fact is that this team runs a league low um, in number of offensive plays. Mm -hmm. So the overall ceiling for any kind of fantasy potential here is just so capped here. Yep. Uh, the, the one positive that I might be looking forward to is uh, Darius Victor possibly returning. He left early last week in the first quarter due to, I think it was a concussion. It was definitely a head injury. Mm -hmm. um, the, the injury status updates have been really poor for the XFL so far. Hopefully that's something that improves as the season progresses. I saw Victor was limited in practice Wednesday, which was yesterday. So maybe McGloin's low A dot throwing benefits Victor. He might be the only guardian though. I'm kind of interested in playing. Yeah, I mean, they looked absolutely horrible last week. Now, again, one of the things that we talk about is the haves and the have-nots. Like, D.C. Mm -hmm. is arguably the favorite to win the whole thing right now. So, you know, losing to them and getting beat up by them is something that a lot of other teams are going are gonna to wind up doing, too. It's not like everybody is, is on the same par in this league right now. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you mentioned it. Like, they could not move the ball last week. He was throwing downfield and winding up throwing interceptions. I mean, it was – it was about as bad a performance as you could have asked for, which again was good for us because we were on the DC side of it with the, with the sports betting. So it made us some money, but you know, they did not look good. The guardians last week. Here's my question for you. Is 10 too many points to lay here with St. Louis or, you know, do you think this is just going to be another game like last week where, you know, like DC blew them out and, you know, now it's St. Louis is starting to do the same. The battle hacks kind of worry me considering they only put up 15 points in that win in week one. So I'm not sure if they have enough to blow out a squad. Right. Uh, the Guardians' defense isn't completely terrible. I'll say that. Uh, they had a, a strong week one, but week two was definitely poor against Cardell Jones. Mm -hmm. uh, I think most teams are going to look poor against the defenders. That's so it, I'm, yeah. I'm not too surprised there. So I think 10's a little high. Uh, what I did last week with a lot of these spreads was parlayed money lines into spreads I was confident about. Mm -hmm. so, so I like doing like the Houston – minus 6.5 and parlaying it with the battle Hawks money line. Yeah. That makes a lot, that makes a little bit of sense here too. Um, that's what I was going to say is right now, when you're looking at these two bets, like to me laying 10 points with anybody is, is a little scary here. Um, I much rather take Houston at, you know, below a touchdown, you know, well, but below a touchdown and an extra point technically in this league. Uh, but I'd much rather take Houston at minus six and a half than lay 10 points with uh, St. Louis, even with St. Louis being at home. Now I wouldn't be shocked if St. Louis winds up winning by 12, 15, 18 points here. But at the same point in time, I, I don't know if I really want to lay any money on it. So that's the way I'm yeah. looking at it here. I still think Houston's the better bet, but yes, I definitely think St. Louis wins this game. I just maybe even tease it down or something like 10 points just mm -hmm. seems like a lot to me. That's, that's a big number to, to try to ask a team to cover. All right. So last game we got here, DC defenders two and zero uh, beat St. Louis beat the hell out of uh, the guardians. Put up 27 and 31 points in the process, so the offense looks good. The defense looked great last week. They are an eight-point favorite against the L.A. Wildcats. <coughs> Wildcats 0-2. They get the award for the toughest schedule to start the season, in my opinion. I mean, you go – you lose to Houston, you lose to Dallas, and now you have to take on D.C. Those are arguably three of the best teams in the league. As a matter of fact, I think those are the three teams with the, the lowest odds to win it all right now. So – they really are the three best teams in the league, and that's the three teams L.A. gets to start. At least they get this one at home. But, you know, against the, uh, the short, odd D.C. defenders here, eight-point favorite, 44 is the total in this game. What are you thinking here? I like that eight-point spread for the defenders. I think they have no problem here with the Wildcats. The Los Angeles Wildcats ranked dead last among all eight teams with eight touchdowns allowed. Their defense is just dreadful right now. And the defenders lead the league in plus minus touchdown differential with plus four. So I think there's a really good shot at this defenders team covering this eight point spread. Um, Cardell Jones leads the league in passing yards. He's tied for yards per attempt. The Wildcats just gave up 305 passing yards last week, 272 yards the week before. I think Cardell Jones is probably one of the better QB plays this week. That's probably going to go under the radar as people look towards Jordan Tamu and uh, Landry Jones and try to find a cheaper option. Mm -hmm. um, his receivers though. I mean, it, this is how this offense has been running is basically through the passing game. Eli Rogers, Rashad Ross, 
DeAndre Tompkins coming back after missing week one. Those are the three guys you want to target here. Rodgers leads the squad in targets. He's been a rock steady PPR option. Rashad Ross leads the league in deep receptions completed with four. Mm -hmm. Most of these teams are trying like desperately to throw deep shots. Cardell Jones is the only one that's throwing catchable deep targets. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a really important factor to consider when you look at uh, other sites tout how many deep targets players are getting because most of these are just thrown poorly to, either to the other team or out of bounds yep Car cardell jones is the only one throwing them somewhat accurately yeah. so that's why i like rashad ross he remains priced up but i think it's worth it and then Tom tompkins he uh, excelled in week one it was really interesting to see the route uh rotation between the, the four Ooh. wide receivers i'm including malachi dupree in there dupree ended up taking a backseat there just 12 routes run and it was Tompkins and Ross that were rotating on the outside. They were neck and neck in terms of routes run, 27 to 26. Okay. So those are the two guys on the outside with Rodgers in the slot. Those are the guys you want to target as far as DFS. Uh, tight end, Kerry Lee, was somebody that we thought would do well. He has one target in each game so far, so he's just kind of an afterthought. But the run game is, has been a weakness for the defenders so far. They're averaging a league low 3.4 yards per carry between Jarrell Presley and Donnell Pumphrey. But the Wildcats run defense ranks dead last per PFF. So this is a good get right spot for them, especially with the spread in their favor. Uh, the Wildcats, if we're looking at them offensively, Josh Johnson did kind of okay in his debut. You could tell that his uh, thigh injury was still bothering him. He only had three rushing yards on four rush attempts. So it's definitely lowering his fantasy potential because he's a guy that we anticipated being a running threat. Yeah, dual threat guy, yeah. Yeah. And it was evident he wasn't 100%. So he's been limited in practice still. He's still expected to be a full go for this game. Mm -hmm. um, the good thing is he has some quality receivers. Nelson Spruce leads the league in targets, 30% target share. He's posted 9 and 15 targets so far in each game. That's rock steady for any kind of cash game options. Uh, Jordan Smallwood, he's a guy that I, I've been really impressed with as far as like his play. The fantasy, fantasy production hasn't been there quite yet. He only went for four catches, 32 yards last week. But he's six foot two, 220. The dude's a, a rock. Like, I think he, it's just a matter of time until he explodes. And then one under-the-radar DFS play that I'm kind of interested in is Saeed Blacknell. He, okay. was in, he was inactive last week but ran the second most routes in week one. Uh, I think he's an interesting DFS punt option for those looking for salary relief. Was there a reason he was inactive last week? Like, was he injured? Was the yeah, in, injury, yep. Okay, so all right. So it wasn't like he was inactive because, you know, they just, you know, coach's decision. So that's always yeah. something that I ask and, and worry about. All right, so I'm writing that name down. So you black Blackmail, okay. Somebody we'll have to look at here for this week's games. Um, all right, so the last thing I kind of wanted to do here. So basically we like Houston minus six and a half. Is this the way you're going there? Yep. Um, Dallas, you like to win, but are you willing to take the – or lay the five with them? Dallas, I am – I took money line on Dallas. Okay. I think they're, so an like, e they're I think they're an easy win. I'm not sure about that five. I took it at four points. So I'm not I'm not yeah, gonna not try to chase it anymore. It's going anywhere. <laughs> yeah, understandable. Um St. Louis, we talked about already, you know, how it's a big number, but we we both think St. Louis is gonna win that game. And then DC, you said you're fine laying the eight with DC on the road. So Correct. three basically three road teams we like here. St. Louis being the only home favorite that we're uh we're kind of on, and they are the only home favorite this week anyway. So pretty much on the favorites this week here, and um, seems to make a lot of sense to me. Last thing I wanted to do before we sign off here, I said last week I just want to kind of take a look at the futures now that we have a couple games in there. D.C., the team that you liked from the beginning at plus 500 and told everyone to get money down on, they're all the way down to plus 200 as the shortest odds on the board. The only team close to them is Houston, who's plus 250. And everybody else has basically jumped up to 600 or above right now. Would you think you'd agree with that? Absolutely. I think those are the front runners. One team I might put some money on if you have some good odds are the St. Louis Battlehawks, yeah. just because they've been contesting in every single game. Mm -hmm. I think Tamu has been the surprise of the XFL. Uh, that, that might be one squad if you have good odds. What are, what are the odds for the Battlehawks now? Well, I was just about to ask you is, is who do you like of the, of the long odds team? So let me give you the odds of some of them. Like Dallas is 600, Tampa Bay is 800, New York and St. Louis are both 1,000. I, ha I have a star next to St. Louis here because that was one I was looking at. The other one that I don't think is crazy is actually LA. LA is 1,400 here too. If I had to put money on somebody long shot wise, like LA is 1,400, Seattle's 1,400. I like LA a lot more than I like Seattle. Um, and then St. Louis and New York are both plus a thousand. 
I, that St. Louis team, to me, they're the biggest surprise. Like, I, I did not expect them to be that good. And, you know, so far they've been in both of their games. Like you said, they lost 28-24 to Houston. There's no shame in that. They beat Dallas, who was a team that a lot of people had. Now, again, Dallas didn't have Landry Jones, all right? They caught him at the right time. But, you know, still, if you're looking for a long shot play, St. Louis at plus 1,000 was the one that stuck out to me. Absolutely agree. And this team has an inflated play volume amount where they're they're facing the Guardians who run the fewest amount of plays. So it's the mm-hmm. complete opposite ends of the spectrum here with the Battle Hawks leading the league in that. And no team runs the ball more than the Battle Hawks. A lot of that's inflated because of Tamu running. Mm-hmm. But Matt Jones and Kristen Michael, I mean, the two are just doing really well. The two combined for over 30 carries last week. And I think we see them run the ball quite a bit here again against the Guardians. See, the, the problem with that, though, is, like, with the two of them splitting, there's really not, like, a – you know, there's better options, right? Like, that, right. that's kind of the – because I looked at them last week, and I was trying to play one of them, and I was like, ah, there's just other guys I like more, you know? Yeah, you have to get lucky with the touchdowns because they're both getting, like, one or two targets apiece. Like, Tammy would rather take off than check down to these guys. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. It makes them a little bit tougher to play in DFS. So, right. like I said, if you're looking for some of that, um, you know, fantasy information, make sure you get over to the Fantasy Guru site, fantasyguru.com. That's where we have all that stuff listed. And then Tyler will have all his XFL plays up in the sports betting package now, right, over at Elite Sports Betting? Correct. Yep, they're up there all now. Right. Yeah, so there you go. So you can get all this information. A lot of the stuff we talked about here today. And, um, hey, make some money playing football over the weekend, which is never a bad thing. So for my man Tyler, this is Benny signing off for another episode of The Opening Line at EliteSportsBetting.com.